So our speaker for today's uh, session is Professor Tharamani Nadeya. Dr. Tharamani is an associate professor and head department of chemistry at Indian Institute of Technology, Rupa. She holds a, uh, a PhD degree from Bangalore University. Prior joining IIT Roper, she spent four years in Germany as a senior scientist and postdoctoral fellow at Rohr University program and a year at University of Saskatchewan, Canada. Her research interests include design and development of various carbonaceous materials, nanomaterials, molecular catalysts with focus on energy conversions and storage. Her scientific output has resulted in 96 publications and four patents at International Referred Journal. She is a recipient of several prestigious fellowships like Alexander von Humboldt Postdoctoral Fellowships, German and Ramanujan Fellowship by Department of Science and Technology, the Government of India. She is an invited fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry and also an elected fellow of Indian Chemical Society. Her research efforts have been recognized in the form of multiple awards, which includes CRSI Bronze Medal 2023, the Chirantan Rasayan Sansta Silver Medal 2023, the Matrom Award 2023 from Electrochemical Society of India, and the 2024 A.V. Ramarao Prize for Women 2024 from the Chemical Research Society of India. So thank you, Professor Taramani, for joining us. The stage is all yours. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. And thank you, ACS, again for this platform to share our ongoing research at our laboratory at IIT Europa. So today I'm going to talk about the designing the greener energy conversion system for a sustainable future. The humankind always requires an energy and it has become indispensable part of our day-to-day -day life. In the past, the non-renewable energy sources such as oil, coal, and natural gases have grabbed the opportunity to become the dominating force in the energy sector. However, the excess consumption and reliance of this one leads to a serious environmental concerns such as water pollution, air pollution, deforestation, along with this, the excess release of CO2 into the environment. According to the International Panel of Climate Change, so we can say that there is an exponential increase of CO2 into the environment, due to which on an average of 1.2 degree increase in the temperature we can see. However, there was a good news during the economic shutdown. So in 2019 to 2021, almost 6% decrease in the CO2 emission. However, by 2021, it is back to the record of 36 gigaton of the CO2 into the environment. If you look at the bar diagram, the China standards to be the, uh, the leading one followed by the United States and followed by the India and Russia. So the excess release of CO2 into the environment. Considering the present population close to the 8 billion and expected to increase 9.6 billion by 2050, and also the craving for the standard in a, the lifestyle, it's very, very important to find the, the promising energy resources. In this case, the hydrogen is in the front runner due to three times high energy density, eco-friendly nature, and more importantly, water is only the byproduct which has been produced. So due to this, so the hydrogen has been extensively utilized in various applications such as petroleum refining, almost 25% for ammonia production, 55% and methanol production 10% and rest of the things is 10%. If you look at that hydrogen demand, so it's increasing every year by 2040, 28 and by 2050, it's almost 78%. However, if you look at the, the hydrogen production, if you look at the hydrogen production sources, still we are depending on 48% of the natural gas and 30% from the oil and also the 18% from the coal and 4% from the electrolysis. It means still 96% we are depending on where we are producing the excess amount of CO2 into the environment. To produce one ton of hydrogen, we are releasing 9 to 12 tons of CO2 into the environment and only the 4% is one of the green approach. So in the water splitting, electrochemical water splitting, so we have the anodic uh, oxygen evolution and also the cathodic hydrogen production. And it is depending on actually the thermodynamic potential in this case is about 1.23. And depending on the pH of the media, the mechanism varies here, especially for the hydrogen, it follows the Wolmer step or the Eroski steps or the Tafel reaction or the combination of the Wolmer step and also the Tafel reaction. However, to develop this uh, water splitting or to produce the hydrogen, we need an efficient catalyst for both hydrogen at the cathode and also the oxygen evolution at the anode. 
And at the present, we have the state of our catalyst, which is ruthenium oxide for the anodic oxygen evolution reaction and also the platinum carbon on the cathode side. However, there are a lot of limitations. So that means the high cost, limited abundance, poor cycling stability, and also the complexity of the system, because we need two different catalysts to uh, produce the hydrogen here. So therefore, in our laboratory, we are addressing to develop the trifunctional catalyst. That means our aim is to uh, reduce the total cost to produce the hydrogen. So what we are trying to do here is that we are integrating the electrochemical storage device, in this case, the metal hair batteries, so zinc hair batteries especially. So to do this one, so we need a trifunctional catalyst. That means the catalyst which can perform the hydrogen evolution reaction along with the oxygen evolution reaction. In addition to this, we need another oxygen reduction reaction because we need to develop the air cathode. To do this one, we need an oxygen bifunctional catalyst, as I said. Again, the state of our catalyst remains the ruthenium oxide for the oxygen evolution reaction and platinum carbon for both the hydrogen evolution as well as the oxygen reduction reaction. But the quite challenging task in the case of development of a trifunctional catalyst is that the single catalyst can perform all the three reactions where the fundamental reaction mechanisms are quite different. So the limitation against the high cost, limited abundance activity for a particular reaction. Although we see a plenty of literature with respect to a single reaction, that means with respect to HER, OER, or ORR, when combined together as a multifunctional catalyst, we have only the handful of literature which are based on the heteroatom doped carbon, metal sulfide, phosphides, and as well as nitrides. The main limitation of this, uh, the existing literature is that poor multifunctional activity, especially with respect to the onset potential, with respect to the oxygen deduction reaction, and the over potential at 10 milliamp per centimeter square per year is greater than 300 millivolts. And same goes with the hydrogen evolution reaction. And when we can devise the overall electrochemical water splitting, the cell potential is greater than 1.62 at 10 milliamp per centimeter square. The same goes with the zinc air battery as well. So here we are developing the cobalt iron sulfide as a tri-functional catalyst. We have been working on extensively on this, but however, I have taken only one example here. This has been synthesized using the hydrothermal treatment with the chloride salts of both cobalt and iron. And the uh, microstructure has been confirmed by the XRD, as you can see here. And after the insertion of the cobalt into the iron sulfide, you can see that there is an increase, that there is a shift here, and also the increase in the lattice constant. So this lattice constant so is, is due to the replacement of the, um, the iron by the cobalt into the surface. And here we are trying to vary the, the component between the co cobalt and the iron to get the maximum efficiency with respect to the multifunctional activity. So the cobalt iron sulfide with three to one ratio, we found that it's a grain lake structure to understand the in-depth morphology by the TM, which confirmed that this grain like structures as due to the formation of this is due to the agglomeration of the the porous nano globules and again this uh, the uh, the diffraction data again it is in uh, 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 correlation with respect to the xrd data and also the eds elemental dot mapping further confirms the coexistence of the cobalt iron sulfur and also more importantly it has been synthesized aiming that to develop the nitrogen carb nitrogen doped carbon which is intrinsic one so which is responsible for the oxygen reduction reaction and the presence of the both cobalt and the, uh, the iron and also the oxidation states of these metals has been confirmed by the XPS analysis and the lower binding energy is due to the metal sulfide and the higher binding energy here, which is due to the presence of the sulfate. Once the material has been synthesized, now we, our aim is to understand the HR activity. Again, another important thing in our study is here, it's not only the tri-functional activity, even we are aiming at to develop the pH universal. So that means the catalyst can perform its activity in acidic media as well as the neutral media and also the alkaline media. So in the preliminary experiments, we have performed the acidic media. So here we have utilized the three electrode system. So and the, uh, the electrolyte, we have utilized the 0.5 molar sulfuric acid. As you can see from this graph, the LSP curve, so this is almost the onset potential is close to the platinum carbon, that is a state of our material, that which is about 45 millivolts. And also the all other variants are also active with respect to that. However, a single metal sulfide the activity is quite low compared to the bimetallic sulfide materials. The same goes with the, in the, in the buffer solution as well. If you can see that the activity is uh, almost close to the, the state of our catalyst and again with the alkaline media. This bar diagram representing that in the, compared to the, all the three media, 
So the onset potential and also the over potential at 10 million per centimeter square is quite low in the case of the acidic media followed by the buffer and also the alkaline media. So that means our catalyst is quite active in all the alkaline media. So in order to apply for the application, so therefore the, the stability test is very important. In this case, we have done the stability test in all the media at 10 milliampere centimeter square for about 25 hours. And also we have compared this activity with respect to the state of art. In this case, it is a platinum carbon. As you can see that the catalyst is almost stable in all the media up to 25 hours. However, you can see that there is a small decay with respect to the platinum carbon, both in the case of alkaline as well as in the case of PBS. After the long-term stability test, again, we check the hydrogen production, as you can see at the bottom graph here. And as you can see here, so the, there's no shift in the, either in the potential or in the decrease in the current, both in the case of the acidic media, as well as in the buffer, as in the keyword. That means the catalyst is quite stable, even with respect to the time scale of 25 to 30 hours. So now, since our aim is to develop the energy storage devices, that means the metal air batteries, for this, we need to understand the oxygen functional activity. So that means with respect to the oxygen reduction reactions, the preliminary experiments we have done performed using cyclic voltammetry. So this we have done in the presence and also in the absence of oxygen to understand whether the catalyst is active towards the oxygen reduction reaction. As you can see that this dotted line shows that this is in the absence of oxygen. As soon as we put the solution, there is a steep increase in the oxidation, the reduction current. This indicates that our catalyst is active towards the oxygen reduction reaction. However, in order to evaluate the kinetics behind this one, so we have performed the experiments in the hydrodynamic condition, both RDE and as well as RRDE. As you can see that the, the cobalt iron with 3 to 1 ratio, the onset potential is almost close to the uh, a state of art catalyst and also the diffusion limited current is also quite high and the, the related of the variants also almost quite uh, close to this with respect to this catalyst. However, the small amount of hydrogen peroxide is producing in the case of cobalt iron and as, as well as other variants also. If you compare the onset potential and also the off wave potential with respect to the state of art catalyst, the cobalt iron 3 to 1 stands out to be the best and almost uh, comparable with respect to the state of art catalyst with respect to the off wave potential as well as onset potential. In addition, we have also compared the surface specific activity, which is very important for the practical application and also the mass specific activity. You can see that. So the three to one shows almost uh, equal with respect to the state of art catalyst, which is followed by the two is to one and one is to one and also the cobalt sulfide. And the number of electrons which has been involved in this case, we have calculated and it is found to be a 3.83 and also the 3.88 for the platinum. And long-term stability in the time scale of 25 hours, the catalyst shows to be the most stable. Whereas in the case of the state of art catalyst, you can see the decrease in the reduction current, which has been observed. After the chronoamphirometric studies, again, we have performed the hydrodynamic condition. And you can see that the LSB has displaced that there is no decay either in the onset potential or in the diffusion limited current. This demonstrate that our catalyst is quite stable. So that means the cobalt iron with the Three to one ratio is good towards the HER as well as ORR as well. So now, since we are aiming at the oxygen bifunctional catalyst and catalytic activity, it's important to understand the activity with respect to the oxygen evolution reaction. Again, we perform the experiment under the similar condition only with respect to the oxygen evolution reaction. As you can see here, there is an increase in the oxidation current. This is due to the oxygen evolution reaction and compared to the other variant, again, three to one standouts to be the best. And the potential required for 10 milliampere centimeter square is only at 254 millivolts. And the activity is better than even compared to the ruthenium oxide. And if you do the stability test, the stability it is quite stable, similar to the water as well as HER. And also you can see that there is a fluctuation with respect to the ruthenium oxide. It is very important to understand the tolerance of the material at various current density. So to understand this one, so we have performed the experiments, chronoamphirometric experiments at the various current density, and even we jumped up to the 250 milliampere centimeter square. And again, when we shift back to the 250 and also the lower current density, the potential almost retain its potential. And now, yes, our catalyst is good towards the OER as well as ORR. It is very important to understand what is the potential difference, which is very important for the zinc air batteries. So therefore, what we have done is that you can see in this graph, 
So we are calculating the potential. That means off pair potential with respect to the oxygen reduction reaction and a potential with respect to the 10 milliampere centimeter square with respect to the oxygen evolution reaction. This bar diagram represents that the OER, both the OER and also the OR activity is quite strong and also for the threes to one compared to the other variants and also with respect to the ruthenium oxide as well as in the platinum carbon for both this reaction. And this bar diagram represents that. The delta E is quite low. This is very important for the zinc air batteries and it's almost equal uh, compared to the one is to three and also the two is to one is to variant. And so therefore we have taken up this one for the further studies for the cobalt iron three is to one. So one step forward for the practical application. So we have assembled the zinc air battery in this case. And uh, so to understand this one, so we have monitored the OCP, that means open circuit potential. And for a comparison, we have taken the platinum carbon as well as the ruthenium oxide, which is very important as a standard catalyst. And as you can see that the current, the potential is almost stable even for 10, 12 hours. There is a small decay in the case of uh, the state of hot catalyst. So now we have connected here. Okay, so this is a demonstration of the zinc air batteries which we connected into the fan and you can see that so without any external power source we are demonstrating that we can run a fan. And we have calculated the power density and the power density is found to be the 350 milliwatt per centimeter square and also the energy density is quite high in the case of our proposed catalyst which is about 1008 watt hour per kg and also when compared to the platinum carbon this is quite stable. And we have done the long term stability experiments in this case and in the long term stability test, you can see that the platinum carbon shows almost the decay in the current, just with less than 20 hours of the time. And whereas in the case of our catalyst, after the 70 hours, you can see that there is an increase in the potential gap. And after the once we refill with the electrolyte, we can again it is regained and the potential gap maintained almost constant even with respect to the 150 hours. So now, so we are devising the complete electrochemical water splitting devices. In this electrochemical water splitting devices, we have taken both the catalysts, both anode and the cathode, the same EO, and then we performed and we found that the potential at 10 milliampere centimeter square is 1.585. So uh, compared to the other catalyst, and also even compared with respect to the single metal sulfide catalyst, and the cell voltage is almost constant for the three different variant, and also it is better than the the state of art catalyst, as you can see that although the onset potential with respect to the state of art catalyst is quite high, the current density is quite low. And again, this device has, the stability of this device has been monitored at various current densities for a longer duration, and it is quite stable. And we have quantified the amount of hydrogen in this case by water displacement method. And also to understand the stability of the catalyst, we have performed the post analysis by ACM XPS as well. And we did not see any changes in the morphology and also the elemental distribution in this catalyst. So this is the demonstration of our the self so water splitting. You can see that we have not using any external power sources and we have connected the two zinc air batteries in series and we could able to see the, the bubbles on the electrode surface. So this is due to the production of the hydrogen. And this is what we are demonstrating the self powered water splitting here. Yes. So now the question is that, so is there any alternative to the electrochemical water splitting? Although this is a promising technology, the question is that this is a high intensive process because the potential requirement is 1.23. And due to the kinetic sluggishness of the oxygen evolution reaction and also the high production of this hydrogen cast. So now, yes, when you look at in this one, so hydrogen sulfide and the methane and the ammonia, when you see this IH2S is one of the promising because it's thermodynamically more feasible compared to other one. And this H2S is considered as one of the noxious pollutants present in the environment. And also it is the waste pollutant from many of the industries and also from the fertilizers and so on. And the trace amount of this H2S present in the environment also has causes a serious health hazardous here. So in industries that to do the desulfurization, so they have established the closed process. But the major disadvantage of this technique is that energy intensive process and the production of sulfur oxide and also the well storage of energy in the water. It means that, so to produce the one metric sulfur production, so they're utilizing 4.4 metric ton of hydrogen, which is wasting as a steam instead of producing here. 
As an alternative, so there are thermolysis, plasma technology, photocatalysis, each technique has the pros and cons. As a whole, when we look at the limitation, it requires high, high temperature requirement, and also it demands the high maintenance cost and also the low product efficiency and the catalytic stability at higher temperature. And overall, the process is quite high. However, when you have the H2S or the sulfur in the chemistry, electrochemistry is not that simple. As you can see here, on the anode, we are producing the sulfur, that means sulfur oxide, and also at the cathode, the hydrogen, and the potential requirement is only 0.142. So the advantage is, again, similar to the electrochemical. We don't need any expensive, and everything can be done at the room temperature. Only the challenge is the catalyst poisoning, and especially for the electrochemist, the accumulation of sulfur on the electrode so once it accumulates on the electrode surface, obviously that for any activity, so it decays because it acts as an insulator. And also the poor durability of the catalyst, this is one of the challenging tasks. And you can see here the corrosion of the catalyst, especially in the presence of H2S. Here, again, we are coming with the approach in order to avoid the sulfur accumulation. So what we are doing is that here, when we are doing the sulfur oxidation reaction, so we are restricting the potential for the only the lower order polysulfide because these are highly soluble in water so that we do not allow this polysulfide to deposit on the electrode surface. So again, the advantage is that continuously we can produce the hydrogen. And apart from this, producing the hydrogen, whatever the polysulfide we are producing in the solution, again, we can extract by the acid treatment. This material can be utilized as a battery material as well. To do this once, I'm just giving one example here, the nickel copper molybdenum sulfide catalyst, which has been synthesized by the hydrothermal treatment. As you can see by the XRD, the molybdenum sulfide, it shows the uh, mixed phases present over there. However, after the addition of either the nickel or the copper, we did not see any changes in the phases over there. This we confirm by the XPS also due to the, uh, the addition of the electronic uh, properties changes after the addition of nickel copper. And the morphology demonstrated that this is a flower-like structure, and also the, the TM demonstrated that this flower-like structure has been modified by the nanosheets. And again, the HRTM confirms the presence of 100 plane of the 1T and also the 2H plane of the molybdenum sulfide. That means the presence of two mixed phases and also the uniform distribution and the coexistence of all the expected elements in the synthesized catalyst. So now the question is that to understand the H2S electrolysis, so we have performed the experiment under the similar condition, similar like the electrochemical water splitting. So only thing is we have purging, we are purging the solution with the H2S for almost three hours. And we have done some of the control experiments to understand the catalytic ability of the proposed catalyst here. You can see that there is an increase in the oxidation current at 0.2 volt, and we are speculating that this is due to the sulfur oxidation reaction. And compared to the nickel molybdenum sulfide and also the just only the copper molybdenum single metal catalyst here, the activity is quite low and also the molybdenum sulfide is quite low compared to this material. Now to confirm whether this is due to the sulfur oxidation reaction or not, we have done some of the control experiments. That means the experiments in the absence of H2S here. When we have done the H2S, you can see this black color graph here. So the current start to increase at 1.52 volt. So that means this curve is due to the oxygen evolution reaction, and it is confirming that this red color one is due to the presence of the H2S, that means sulfur oxidation reaction. Next, now let's compare the potential, that means how much potential we are saving here. If we compare with respect to the thermodynamic potential, we are saving almost 1.03 volts of energy compared to the electrochemical water splitting. When we compare this with respect to the measure with respect to the a proposed catalyst and we are saving almost 1.23 volts. And when we compare the, the potential at the same various current density in both the processes, there is a small decay in the current, however, it is quite stable. So motivated by this, we removed the external power contact and we connected with the 1.2 volt battery. And you can see that here, the bubbles on the electrode, this bubbles on the electrode is due to the hydrogen production and also the yellow color in the solution due to the polysulfide on the anode side. Whereas in the absence of H2S, so we did not see any bubbles on that. That means 1.2 volt is not enough to split the electrochemical watch splitting here. And then again, we further shift to the DC power supply, not only the 1.2 volt, you can see that the 0.8 itself is good enough to produce this, uh, the hydrogen in the presence of H2S, but we don't see anything electrode on the electrode in the absence of H2S. So this is very important to understand the stability to do this one. So we have done the to understand this one we have done the chrono chrono experiment that means a sequential 
uh, changes, we are polarizing the sample step, particular potential for a particular time, and we try to monitor the changes in the color of the solution as well. As you can see that there is a step-like increase in after 2.2 volt, you can see that is sudden steep increase in the current over there. And here at the same time, you can see that from the colorless to the pale yellow color and also the color is increasing. So this is due to the production of that means a polysulfide in the solution and with increase in the time so that the turbidity of the solution increases because still we have a lot amount of the polysulfide in the solution. However, when you switch back this one, this is the beauty of the experiment that means Still, it is retaining the same current density even when we switch back from the higher to the lower potential. That means that the sulfur is not accumulating on the electrode surface. However, we cannot expect the pale, the, the colorless solution because we already have the polysulfide solution, polysulfide in the solution. Again, we perform the linear sweep voltammetry up to 1000 cycles. You can see that up to 500 cycles, we did not see any decay in the potential or even in the current here. However, a small decay after the 750th cycle and also the south, but considering the stability and also the, especially the sulfur accumulation, this is quite commanding. To demonstrate that whether the restricting the potential will work out or not, we have performed the experiments. That means we have polarized the sample beyond the 0.66 volts. You can see that after 0.6 or 0.7 volts, there's a decay in the current in the present that means there is a production of the sulfur directly in the during the electrocatalysis it is accumulating on the electrode surface therefore we can see that a sudden decrease in the current after the 250 cycle so therefore this is demonstrating that we can restrict the polysulfide or the, that means the lower order polysulfide so that we can avoid the accumulation on the electrode surface so again to understand the, the long durability that means yes of course we are demonstrating that it can be done however it is very important to see that still whether the hydrogen is produced for the longer duration and we are trying to monitor on the electrode surface at every 25 to 30 hours you can see that there's still a lot of bubbles even up to 150 hours and here we need to change the electrolyte because as i said that especially after 25 to 30 hours so the turbidity of the solution is increasing because the, the production of the polysulfide, therefore every 30 hours almost we are keep changing the electrolyte and the current is almost quite stable. Here we are demonstrating, you can see here, this is a movie. So it is not only the 1.8 or the 0.8 volts, we are applying only a 0.3 volts in the presence of H2S and you can see the lot of bubbles. That means we are producing the hydrogen during the sulfur oxidation reaction. That means H2S electrolysis. When it comes to the water splitting here, so in the absence of H2S, but 0.3 volts, we did not see any bubbles at all. So that means we are not producing the water at all at this potential. So that means this potential is not enough to split the water to produce the hydrogen. When we calculate the energy consumption for the oxygen evolution reaction, we need about 37 kilowatt hour per meter cube. And when you compare with respect to the sulfur oxidation reaction, it's almost six times. This is what we predicted. So before starting this experiment. And we, again, we have quantified this hydrogen as well. So by both the, the water displacement as well as the online GC. And you can see that the hydrogen evolution rate, rate is quite stable. And also the Faraday coefficient is almost 98%. And the hydrogen evolution rate is increasing with respect to the potential here. Yes. And to understand the polysulfide produced in the solution, we monitored simultaneously by UV visible spectroscopy, which confirms the lower order polysulfide. Again, now the question is that obviously, apart from producing the hydrogen here, so we are also producing the sulfur. That means whatever the polysulfide which has been dissolved in the electrolyte, again, through the acid treatment, we are precipitating, you can see the yellow color, and we have extracted this material and through the XRD, it confirms that whatever the material which has been produced is the elemental sulfur. This elemental sulfur can be utilized as the, uh, the battery material, either as an anode or a cathode, depending on the APS or the nano APS system, because the capacity is quite high in this case, especially 1,675 milliampere hour per gram. In our laboratory also, we are utilizing this sulfur and especially for the APS sodium ion sulfur and also the magnesium ion sulfur battery. So now since our material is that we have the molybdenum sulfide, the question comes that whether the sulfide oxidation is due to the presence of the sulfur or due to the H2S. To confirm this one, what we did is that we have done some control experiments. That means we have performed the experiment chrono analysis for 30 hours at a particular potential year uh, where the sulfur oxidation occurs and without the presence of H2S. 
but you can see that we do not see any changes in the color that means the polysulfate yellow color in the solution and for to further confirm we have done the acid treatment but we did not see any precipitation that means there is no polysulfide produced due to the the mol molybdenum sulfide in this case again another approach we have done the auto oxidation also even we kept the solution for one week to 10 days and we did not see any precipitation this confirms that whatever the sulfur or the polysulfide produced is due to the h2s and that means the electrocatalysis of h2s not by the uh, our catalyst and to understand again that whether the activity is due to the catalyst or not again without the catalyst we have performed some of the control experiments and we seen that with increase in the potential also we did not see any bubbles on the electrode so that means this is not good enough to produce the hydrogen even at 0.8 volt so we need the catalyst to break this h2 into hcl sulfur and to do this catalysis and also to produce the hydrogen so now the another important topic is the chlorine Yes, that chlorine is a key block element for the many manufacturing industry, especially the textile industries, medicinal application, organic chemicals, inorganic compounds, and chlorine-free products. If you look at the chlorine usage, the chlorine has been utilized for 30% in the PVC and the solvents, 24%, organics, 13%, and water, and also the other, it is almost 10% and 5%. So the chlorine has been utilized. However, the byproduct which has been produced is HCl. And we do not know how to utilize this HCl and it is not eco-friendly at all. The, the developing countries are simply quenching with the line, which is not eco-friendly process. In industry, some of the industries, what they're doing is that HCl electrolysis they're doing, but the major problem of this HCl electrolysis is again 1.36, that means high intensity energy intensive process here, because the chlorine oxidation taking place at 1.36 and also the hydrogen at zero volt. That means 1.36 is required for this. Another major problem is that if you want to apply this for the industrial application during the uncontrolled shutdown, so this membrane, always the membrane has a small permeability for the chloride ions. So therefore, the accumulation of hydrogen and also the chloride ions on the cathode causes a serious safety concern. So therefore, our approach is that we want to replace the oxygen, sorry, hydrogen evolution reaction by the oxygen reduction reaction. We want to keep the chlorine oxidation reaction constant. So that means we are replacing from zero volt of the hydrogen evolution reaction by 1.23 of the oxygen reduction reaction. And we call this process as the oxygen depolarized cathode material. And we can save almost the 30% of the energy. So here, I'm not going to introduce the macroelectrochemistry. I just want to give a, a brief uh, the introduction about the microelectrochemistry and the, how one can utilize the scanning probe technique to establish or to design the stable catalyst for a particular system. So therefore, what we have done is that here we have taken the platinum microelectrode and we have performed the normal cyclic voltammetry. And you can see that there's an increase in the oxidation current. Again, we are speculating this is due to the chlorine oxidation. And again, on the cathode, we do see that this is due to the uh, oxygen reduction reaction. To confirm whether the peak is due to the chlorine oxidation or not, so we have done some of the control experiment in the absence of the uh, chloride ions. You can see that the oxidation current is increasing at 1.8. That means this peak is due to the presence of the chlorine. And again, we can see that so this is the typical behavior of the hydrogen adsorption and the desorption peak, especially in the acidic media. What we did here is that, so the similar approach here, since it is a scanning probe microscopy instead of a three electrode system. So here it's a four electrode system. That means we are introducing the platinum microelectrode. You can see that this is the electrochemical setup what we have it here. This is a glassy carbon. That means sample of our interest can be placed on this one. And this is our the reference electrode and counter electrode. Only thing is we are utilizing this platinum 25 micrometer platinum microelectrode. And we are utilizing the redox computation mode of SCCM here. In the case of redox computation mode of SCCM, you can see here, so the sample on the surface and we are applying a potential that means we are polarizing the sample at a constant potential with respect to the oxygen reduction reaction where it can convert to the water and we are trying to apply a potential on the uh, tip and we try to monitor the current on the tip here. So this is the potential pulse program. So this have given an uh, example for the in the case of the buffer media. So what we do is that you can see that the red color and also the blue color here. So we continuously polarize the sample where it is oxygen is reducing to the water. And at the working electrode, and we are trying to give the pulse profile, what we do here is that oxygen reduction reaction, that means we need the oxygen in the solution. 
Since it is a microelectrochemical approach and also the electrode is displaced 10 to 15 micrometer above the electrode surface, and uh, the, both the electrodes are competing for the available oxygen, and this we call it as a local catalytic activity. In case if you want to understand the oxygen reduction reaction, we need to purge the solution. But if you need the further solution, then we are going to create the convection effect. So to avoid this one, so we are generating the oxygen. So by applying a potential, that means we know that the electrochemical water splitting, we can split at 1.2. So therefore, we have the enough of oxygen between the gap with the trip and the substrate. So now this is very important, as you can see here. So this we call it as the redox computation mode of SCCM. So that means the both the tip and also the uh, samples are competing for the available oxygen in the gap. If the catalyst is strong enough, it consumes oxygen and reducing to water. And so therefore we are measuring the current at the tip. So therefore the amount of oxygen left at the tip will be less. And again, we are again applying the base potential where there is no reaction. This kind of a potential pulse we keep applying at every grid point. So that means when we move the sample, let's say 10 micrometer, 50 or 25 micrometer, and we keep applying. So therefore, the spatial resolution of the activity is quite high compared to the macroelectrochemistry. This is one of the extended profile programs. So that means during the oxygen reduction pro reaction, also we face the hydrogen production. This hydrogen production also simultaneously one can monitor. And this is actually uh, the customized one, depending on the application, one can fine tune this one. You can see here the oxygen reduction reaction and also the oxygen production here. And again, applying the base potential, whatever you were producing the hydrogen peroxide, again, reduce back to the water and indirectly you can calculate the amount of hydrogen peroxide also. So now coming back to the HCL, so that means we are utilizing this technique to understand and to establish the, uh, the stable catalyst here. What we have taken is the test sample platinum on the glassy carbon, because we know that for oxygen reduction reaction, platinum is a standard catalyst. However, we cannot apply this pulse profile in this case. The reason just because, so if we apply the 1200 to generate the oxygen, again, we are invoking the chlorine as well. So therefore, we need to modify the pulse profile. That means we are not applying the 1200 and we are applying only the base potential and only the measuring. Surprisingly, you can see that this is a 3D image. We do not see any hump in this case with respect to the platinum spot. What we did is that we have taken the sample out and we checked this under the microscope and we've seen that there are a lot of holes on the electrode surface. And then we, the, after the close observation, you can see that the distance between these two, the spots is almost a 50 micrometer and the diameter of this each spot is about 25 micrometers. That means we are moving the electrode at every 50 micrometer of the grid point and also the diameter of our platinum micro electrode is 25 micrometer. But to confirm whether our speculation is due to the platinum dissolution or not, we have done some of the control experiment in the absence of chloride, that means sulfuric acid. As you can see on the right hand side, we do not see the etching of the surface or on the dots on the surface. To further confirm, we have done some of the chronoalphirometric experiments. That means we are polarizing the sample and we try to monitor on the tip of the thing and at various potential at a particular time interval. And we have calculated the absolute current with respect to the potential. When we calculated the absolute potential with respect to the potential, so we can see that the chlorine start to evolve at 50 millivolts itself. Whereas we have applied almost to the 400 millivolts as a base potential and also the measuring potential is 150 millivolts. So that means we are producing already the chlorine. So therefore this whatever the black spots is due to the etching of on the surface due to the dissolution of the platinum chloride. Here. So therefore we want to stabilize this one. We have chosen silver as a catalyst here. So what we did is that that we have electro deposited platinum silver. The aim is that the silver potential is quite low. That means for around 0.8 volt compared to the platinum, which is 1.2. If you want to apply for the industrial application so that during the uncontrolled shutdown, that means when the cathode is not under the potential control, this uh, silver will precipitate on the ele electrode surface. It forms the silver chloride, which is insoluble. And again, when the process continues, again, it reduces back and it is available as a silver with respect to the platinum. In this way, this platinum silver is stabilizing the catalyst. So we monitor this through the uh, SCCM. Again, you can see that this is a 2D image of the, uh, the platinum silver. Again, this has been done by the redux computation mode of SCCM. We have captured this image at various uh, time intervals that 28 milliseconds itself, you can see the bright spot. And this, this is the 3D image of the same at various potential applied substrate potential. That means we are polarizing the sample at minus 100 
millivolts and minus 150 millivolts and also the minus 200 millivolts. It means that you can see that this ump is quite high compared to the minus 100 and so the minus 200. This demonstrate that means the tip current is quite low in this case. That means the activity is quite high at minus 150 because the amount of oxygen left at the tip is very less because our catalyst has consumed to convert into the product. So to understand the stability test and to mimic the industrial conditions, so this is again the homemade cell. What we have done is that we have taken the two platinum electrodes. That means we want to generate the chlorine and we want to enrich the solution. So that means we are uh, pumping the chlorine rich HCl solution and we try to see the uh, stability of our electrode by chronoamphorometric analysis. You can see that the even with respect to there is a small decay in the current here. The current start to decrease again. The current start to almost stable even after 30 hours. And this experiment has been done at five molar HCl because the people wanted to understand that at higher because generally industry we go with the 400 millimolar of HCl, but for the to see the the stability at higher in this case we have utilized for the five molar HCl. And this is one of the photographic image to demonstrate that obviously the electrode you can see that the chlorine is produced. However, we could not quantify it because of the limitation. So we cannot do by either the RRDE experiment because the surface is etching on even through the um, online GC. So we are trying to extract and to quantify the chlorine in the future experiments using the microelectrochemistry itself. So with this, I would like to thank my group and also the funding agency DST as well as the DST Nanomission and the Raman Jam Fellowship. So when I joined here to establish my laboratory as and also the SCRB and CSIR and also the IIT Europa, along with the Alexander von Humboldt Foundations, where I sponsored this SCCM instrument. And also thank you all for your kind attention.